Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Grace Simpkins, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, which is spread across the country and helps connect NOAA and people to every, helps connect people to all that NOAA does. It's also sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant, which is where I work, which is located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. NOAA Live webinars will be offered most Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Eastern time, and you can simply follow us on Facebook or visit our website to find out about upcoming webinars. Now, this series is designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of the incredible experts that we have. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, which stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Now, today, I'm gonna to be introducing you to my friend, Kanisa Duncan Serafin, who works with NOAA's Hawaii Sea Grant in Honolulu, Hawaii. I should say Hawaii. Uh, while we'll be talking about NOAA's role in storm preparedness, we wanna recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of native communities who have substantial knowledge and um, traditional knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that Kanisa is coming to us from the ancestral Hawaiian lands and seas, and we are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Head Aquina. Now, a few guidelines before I hand it over to Kanisa. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line, but we want you to ask questions. So please write your questions in that question box you've been using already. I will keep track of them for Kanisa and I will ask them whenever she pauses. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. We might not get to yours, but we'll, we'll try to answer as many as we can by the end of the webinar. Now, enough of my uh, talking. I know you're eager to hear what Kanisa has to share. So without further ado, Kanisa, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Mahalo, thank you, Grace. Aloha kako, hello everyone. Uh, it's certainly my pleasure to be here today. And I'm going to go ahead and, um, oh, you can see my screen, right? Yes, we can, we see it nice and clear. Perfect. So today we're going to talk about designing to survive storms and how to prepare your house. But first, a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up swimming all over the place, but mostly in pools. Um, I was actually born in Canada, and I grew up a lot in California, Colorado, a little bit in Florida. Um, but I really wanted to swim like a fish, and then I decided, ooh, I want to study fish. So this is a picture of me when I was a little girl, um, just after swim practice, and then my very first trip to the tide pools in Monterey, California, where I'm checking out a sea star, and I knew that I just wanted to spend time learning about the ocean creatures. After I finished college, I went to Hawaii in the late 90s to study sharks, and I studied population biology of hammerhead sharks for my PhD. And our lab also studied all other kinds of big fish and big sharks. So there's a picture of a tiger shark swimming away um, after we put a tag on it and measured it um, and done some research on that guy. And then a sandbar shark up against the boat in the top picture. But now, as Grace said, I work for Hawaii Sea Grant. And instead of doing science research myself, I really help people to share the science research that they've done. So I host a TV series called Voice of the Sea and also work with teachers and write curriculum and activities for students. So we're gonna share today some of our Voice of the Sea videos, some clips from our episodes, as well as an activity from our Sea Earth Atmosphere curriculum. And you can find everything we're gonna to share today also has links on the NOAA Live site where you uh, registered. So first I have a question for you and um, you can go ahead and write your answer in the chat along with where you live and Grace will give us a count of how many of us have been in a big storm like a hurricane, a tornado or a flood. So my question is, have you ever been in a big storm? Okay, so this is Grace from the chat box. So go ahead and write in that box. Like Kanisa said, have you ever been in a big storm? And, and you can even let us know where you're from and what type of storm it was. So were you in a hurricane? Um, depending on where you live in the country, you might've been in a tornado. Have you been in any flooding? If you live on the Cape, I have to say we had a little bit of flooding uh, the last couple of days. So go ahead and let me know. Let's see, Isabella says yes. 
Um, she's been in a big storm. Anybody else been in a big storm? Oh, we have a couple of people here. Alice and Paul have been in a big hail storm in Texas. Shannon's been in flooding in nor'easters here on the Cape. Michelle's been through a Cape Cod hurricane and Rick went, went through Typhoon Uma on Guam where there were 200 mile an hour winds. And Mylene said that um, there's been flooding in Texas. And some folks are mentioning big thunderstorms. So I think, thank you for letting us know that that sort of captures what everyone's been through. Awesome, those are definitely some storms. How about the 200 mile an hour winds in Guam? That would be really scary. Um, so where I live in Hawaii, um, our hurricane season actually for the whole Central Pacific runs from June through November. And each year we prepare for hurricanes. Uh, you can see the hurricane lane, which hit us in 2018, so two years ago. And this is a NOAA animation of that hurricane approaching the Hawaiian Islands. Um, up in the upper right hand corner, that's actually my neighbor. So I took that photo standing on my back deck. and. Uh, they boarded up their house, they're all prepared, and then I thought it was funny because they spray painted on the window board, bring it lane, because they were they felt like they were storm ready at that point. And then um, the bottom picture is actually a, a house on the big island of Hawaii. So it's the one, the most southern of our Hawaiian islands where Hurricane Lane hit first. And as you can see from the the NOAA radar image, the hurricane lane actually broke up as it hit the Hawaiian Islands. So the damage was not nearly as bad as it, it could have been. But I also wanted to point out that when we talk about preparing for storms, it's really important to remember that it's not just the hurricanes or those big 200 mile an hour winds, it's the other type of storms that you guys mentioned, like the lightning storms, the northeaster, the flooding, the hail. Um, we actually even had hail here in Hawaii a couple of years ago that caused a lot of damage because our plants and environments not used to getting hail. Um, so here you can see um, a picture from 2018. So again, two years ago in April, we had a massive flooding event. We actually got almost 50 um, inches of rain in 24 hours on the north shore of Hawaii and it caused extensive damage, but it was a storm without a name. It wasn't a big hurricane that people have been preparing for for many um, days or weeks. And then on the right-hand side, there's actually a picture that my friend sent me from Honolulu a couple of weeks ago of just regular rain causing a lot of flooding there in Honolulu. And actually last night we had another storm and for my morning meetings, a bunch of people's power were out. So when we talk about preparing our houses and ourselves for storms, it's not just those huge events. And then of course, as you guys shared, it's not just storms that come to Hawaii. So my Sea Grant colleague, David Christopher, sent me this photo of flooding in Delaware. And then my friend, Erin, who lives in Louisiana, this is her home having flooding earlier in um, 2020. Uh, and now I thought it would be kind of a good time to stop and see if you guys have any questions about what we've covered so far. All right, this is Grace from the chat box. Don't forget to write in your questions. And while um, I give you a minute to write your questions in, I just wanna to mention too, that if you're interested in learning more about hurricanes, the storms themselves, or tornadoes, or some of those big storms, we have um, done some webinars. So you can take a look at some of our archived um, webinars to learn more about how those storms form and um, what, what um, goes into bringing them to land. All right, so we have a couple of questions. Bodhi is asking, during these storms, is it always scary? That's a great question. And I thought about that before today's talk. So my last slide is actually like, the storms I think are really beautiful as long as you're prepared and, and not worried about your safety or your house's safety or your family or your pets, right? So, um, it's certainly seeing the power of nature, you know, in the amount of rain or wind or lightning. Snow is really beautiful. Um, but it, in order to enjoy those types of events, it, we have to be prepared. Great. And so Michelle asks, how much rain 
um, causes flooding. Is there a way to know if a storm is going to bring enough rain where you're going to see flooding or you might just you know, see normal rain from a storm? That's a really good question. And I think you can get a sense of how flooding impacts your area by, by your experience or by talking to people who live in your place. So flooding, um, in order for something to flood, it needs a, a ground or a, a surface that we call impermeable. And that can happen if it's like a lot of concrete or something that water can't go through or if it's rained a lot before and the ground is saturated. So if the ground is full of water, then when more rain comes, it will start ponding. So sometimes we get flooding because it's rained for many, many days in a row um, and the ground hasn't had a chance to dry out. Or like in the case of the flood picture I showed you from Hanalei, Hawaii, um, the rain just came so much at one time that it couldn't go into the ground and so we got flooding. Um, Another reason that we get flooding in Hawaii, and I'll show you some pictures later, but as the high tides move in, the, the lava rock that makes up our islands is actually really porous. And so the sea level will actually push some of the water, our, our drinking water that's already percolated through the ground and is stored in underwater aquifers, and it actually pushes it up. And so we get flooding from the high tides sometimes in places where there's not a lot of beach fronting the, the land to protect it. That was a very comprehensive answer. I wasn't sure how I would, I would uh, capture it all. You did a nice job with that, Kanisa. Um, our next question for you is, Mylene is wondering, does global warming make storms more intense? I believe, I'm not a storm scientist myself, but my understanding is that as our temperatures, our global temperatures rise, that we get more difference between that there's a hotter hot and, and then the cold colds and when those come together, that's what creates our, our big storms. And so the prediction is that we'll have more violent storms, but perhaps not more numerous storms, but the ones that we have will they may be more violent. And that means they may be more cold in temperature, they might be windier, they might dump more rain. Um, but instead of kind of small storms, periodically we may have larger storms that don't come quite as frequently. Couldn't have said it better myself. Um, last question, and I don't want you to answer this, Kanisa, because I know you're coming up, but I want to give a shout out to Emmett from Bend asking, how do you prepare for a hurricane? And I just want to let Emmett know that Kanisa is going to be talking about that. So I'm going to hand it back to you and hold on to any questions we get so that you can keep going. Awesome. Um, so I also wanted to share with you that we get sort of storms even from far away can bring weather. Um, and you guys experience that on the East Coast of the United States where um, hurricanes will bring big surf or in California storms in the Northern Pacific will bring big surf. We just had some of the biggest surf here in Hawaii that we've had in the past decade. On January 17th, these pictures um, are showing Piahi or also known as Jaws Maui. And my friend Mike Coots took that photo of the wind surfer and the other surfer from a helicopter. Um, and then the other picture is of Waimea Bay, which is on the north shore of Oahu. And those you can see by the scale of those people walking across the sand that the waves were really big. Um, but they came without a lot of weather. We had beautiful sunny skies and no wind, but we had these giant waves that were caused by a storm in the North Pacific. And what happens when we get those big waves is that they can cause erosion. And you can see it's like a beautiful sunny day. So this drone video is taken by our um, coastal hazard specialist at Hawaii Sea Grant, Shelley Habel. And this is the North Shore of Oahu and you can see all the trees that have fallen down um, and the houses that are now in some cases part of them are, are falling into the ocean. In a lot of cases they have um, septic tanks and things that hold their wastewater for their home and now that has been breached by the ocean. So um, the erosion causes a problem and then once the beach is gone, we talked about how do you know if you're going to have flooding well, in a lot of coastal areas, and it's true here in Hawaii, 
because we don't have beaches anymore that we they've been eroded by storms and big waves now our roads and buildings are really close to the ocean and so even on a calm day like these two pictures are showing pretty calm ocean conditions we're looking at the south shore of oahu where waikiki is and there's lots of big buildings and the water's coming right up into the buildings into the restaurants on a high tide similarly we're looking at the west coast of maui on the other side and a calm day but a really high tide coming up onto the road and causing erosion um, and that's the only road there on the west side of maui so if the road um, you know, gets eroded by the high tide, there won't be a way for people to get to where they live. Okay, so now I have a question for you as we're going to start into our activity, and that is what um, designs or materials do you think can help buildings survive storms, erosion, and floods? Okay, so this is Grace from the chat box. So Kinesis question, and don't forget, you're going to write your, you're going to type your answer in. What designs or materials will help buildings survive storms, erosion, and floods? So Mylene says maybe stilts. Um, Alice and Paul are suggesting using concrete. So that's good. We've got materials and we've got um, designs. Isabella says maybe if you use grass. And I'm making a mental list here, comparing it to what I know Kinesa is going to share with us. And I told you they were a pretty savvy crew, didn't I? Um, Jackie said pile wood, maybe. Michelle um, says concrete. So those are some ideas. There, people are giving us ideas on materials. Any other ideas on what you can do as a modification? Eve mentioned stilts again. Um, Emmett says maybe put it on a high platform. Any other ideas? Uh, oh, Bodhi says put drains in the concrete. That's a good idea for flooding. Um, any last ideas before I hand it back to Kanisa? Things that you might be able to do to a building that would help it withstand a big storm. Hmm. Oh, elevation, everybody. So Edith says elevation as well. All right, with that, I'm gonna hand it back to you, Kanisa. I saw some great ideas there. Awesome. So I mentioned that uh, our activity we're gonna do today is from that Sea Earth Atmosphere Curriculum. And if you go to our website, which you can get to from the NOAA Live link, you can print out um, this cardboard house template. So it has the house part, the main roof part, and then also um, these two side roof pieces. And we're gonna use that to go ahead and build a cardboard house. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. There you go. Okay. Um, so I have my house already cut out and I'm gonna go ahead and build it. And while I do that, we can kind of talk about the materials that I'm using and why we chose to do it this way. So you can of course design your own house if you wanted to do this yourself, you don't have to make our printout. But the printout, I did design it with little um, tabs. Let me see how you can see this. So little tabs and then notches so that you can build it without using any glue or tape and that way you can always take it apart and it also makes it more environmentally friendly uh, and we've experimented with different types of cardboard and pretty much anything will work this one is a cracker box but cereal box works good um, thicker cardboard also works good and then um, you're just going to put the size of the house in here there's little slits here we go, face the cardboard side out. So those are my side roofs. And then I've got my main roof here. Okay. And this is just the house that we're gonna use to talk about today and different design features or ways that we might modify the house to make it more storm proof. We're gonna start off with wind. So I have a fan here and I have a question for you guys. What do you think will happen when I turn the fan on? All right, this is Grace from the chat box. What's your guess as to what's gonna happen when Kinesa turns the fan on? I think you can all guess, but go ahead and type it in so that I can share it with Kinesa. What's the first thing that's gonna happen? Huh. Jackie says, the roof will go flying. Bodhi says, uh, the roof will go flying. Isabella says it will fall, so maybe the whole thing will fall. So I think people think either the whole thing is going to move or 
definitely the roof is going to blow off. Let's do it. Give it a try. Yes, I'm right. excited. Hang on. Hmm. Can you guys see the roof is moving, but nothing's happening. Do we have any ideas about why the roof might not be flying off? Hmm. Why the is the why? Go ahead. What do you think? Why is so the fan is on right now? You might not be able to see it. The fan is on, but the roof, although it's moving a little bit, is not flying off the house. So Edith guesses that it's the position of the roof, which I think you're on the right track there, Edith. So Okay. Yeah, I like Edith has a really good point. Let's try to turn the house the other way and we'll turn our fan back on. And James thought that maybe the angle, James and Katya both thought that it might have something to do with the angle of the roof. Okay, I think I think you guys both have good points. Let's see what happens. We've turned the house the other direction. Woo! So we lost our roof that time. Let's try it again, just because that was, that was kind of fun. So we've got it on, turn the fan on. And it takes a second for the wind to kind of get underneath the house. And once it's lifted up, that time I gave it a little bit of help. I, I poked it with my finger. So you guys have really good points. If the house is turned this way, um, there's less surface area for the wind to come up underneath and grab the roof and, and pry it off. And if it's turned this way, um, where we've got all of this surface area hanging over, there's just much more of the roof for the wind to get and pick it up and take it off. So essentially it becomes, uh, there's more kite kind of for the wind to, to attack and push it off. So how do you think we could keep our roof from flying off in my pretend hurricane here? Okay, so this is Grace from the, the chat box. What are your ideas? How can we keep that roof from falling off? What, what modification can we make? I'm asking you all to put on your engineer hat right now and be engineers. So what can we do to that roof um, to make it stay on? So Jackie suggests maybe you could put rocks on top of it. So um, Jackie's thinking, I think that you weigh it down. James is saying maybe nails and glue, so it's attaching it. Um, any other ideas? Um, Bodhi thinks maybe if you put it at more of a slant. Edith just suggests that you anchor it. Michelle agrees, nail it down. And so I think Anna is thinking in terms of your cardboard house, you could tape it. Um, so I think I'm gonna stop there because I think you're gonna show us a really cool solution. So, so you guys on. are all correct. Um, and Advent is actually a cardboard house that Grace and I experimented with last week. And if I hold it really close, I think you can see there's still um, some sticky stuff left on it from our experiment, which made it heavier. So it actually didn't fly as easily as it did last week when we tested this. Um, and additionally, if I hadn't, if it didn't have all the sticky stuff stuck to it, the whole house would have fl flown away because that's, because it wouldn't be heavy enough. So the wind would push it really easily. So you guys are correct that if it's, your materials are heavier, it's harder for the wind to push it. Um, another thing, uh, houses often have a foundation, right? So I'm gonna go ahead, I have some Play-Doh here. And the recipe for this Play-Doh is also in our activity. It's just some water, um, salt and cream of tartar. Uh, so I can put my house on a foundation and that will make it stickier. Um, you guys also mentioned wood and nails. Um, and that's exactly what builders do. The engineers have come up with uh, certain designs. They're called hurricane clips and they allow you to, they're metal. And they're not actually very strong. If you touch one, you're, you'd be surprised. You're like, wow, this can hold my roof on during a hurricane. But because we put on many of them and we attach the roof in lots of places, those small metal clips, those hurricane clips can actually keep a roof of a house 
from flying off even in very, very strong winds. So I'm doing the same thing here. I'm just attaching, I'm using the Play-Doh to attach my roof. And I'll just share with you, Katya had a um, good idea that putting something in front of the house so that the wind will blow in a different direction, so to sort of divert the wind was another idea that came in. Right, because we talked about the direction and, um, and how that affects the roof. And if you talk to the hur people who studied hurricane damage or the hurricane forecasters, they will tell you the same thing. And often in a, a big storm like a hurricane, uh, some houses that are facing one direction will all lose their roofs. And then the ones that are facing a different direction will be able to keep their roofs on. So I like that idea of being able to, a, a windbreak we might call it, I think. Okay, let's go ahead and turn the fan on and see if we've secured our roof. And I'll just use this so you can see that the fan is definitely blowing still, but my house, we gave it a foundation. It seems nice and sturdy. And then even if I kind of poke at the roof, I'm lifting up the whole house, in fact, but it's not blowing away. So we did an excellent job of securing our roof. Well done. Good job, engineers. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and um, put my slides back up because I want to show you what these hurricane metal ties look like in um, some pictures. So the first picture is just different styles of metal ties. And then the bottom picture is um, a house on the island of Kauai where I live from Hurricane Niki in 1992. Um, so quite a while ago, but you can see that the roof was just taken straight away off the house. Um, and so after hurricanes like that, uh, engineers came up with designs that would help the roofs stay on. And now it's mandatory if you build a home, a new home in a hurricane area, you have to put the clips on as you're building it. And so the upper right picture I circled in red, some of the hurricane clips that are on the house as it's being built. But you can also retrofit or um, add on hurricane clips to an existing home. And so actually all of our Sea Grant or most of our Sea Grant programs have these homeowners guides that will lead you step by step through doing that. Um, and it, it, it doesn't actually take that long. It takes some, some hard work, but you can hurricane proof your roof or at least make it much, much more solid. And we have a lot of evidence that tying on roofs using these hurricane clips is actually effective. So the bottom photo is from a house in Hurricane Katrina where um, the roof was held on by those hurricane clips and it, it survived the storm. So, and Kinesa, you know, can I just ask you two quick questions before you move on? Because um, Alice and Paul are wondering if those hurricane clips work for tornadoes as well. Do you know? Mm, so I, I was going to talk about tornadoes today, but I knew that we were limited on time. So I took out that slide, but I'm really glad you asked the question. Uh, engineers are still working on designs for tornadoes or homes and places that that have tornadoes. I certainly think that it would help, but in a tornado you have rotational winds, um, which cause um, are more difficult to deal with. Like we talked about the direction of the house wind and how that matters, but certainly having your roof attached is going to be better than not having it attached. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, so you guys also talked about a foundation, and um, our engineers would call that a continuous load path. So that's the ideal goal in terms of tying your house to itself and to the ground. And if you have a continuous load path, that means that your roof is attached to your house, which is attached to your foundation, which is secured to the ground. And that is um, sort of our gold standard or the goal to make your house as safe as it can for high winds. But as we were talking about roofs, I just wanted to share some pictures of roofs that are designed for other climates. So you guys mentioned a hurricane, or sorry, a tornado just now. Um, and we were talking about windy environments, but in places where it might not be windy, but they have other types of weather, like a lot of rain. So these homes in Northern Europe are designed with really, really uh, steep roofs so that the rain can shut off very quickly. 
or the home with the living grass roof in Norway um, is a design that's pretty common in areas where it's very, very cold. And so by having that living roof, it actually helps to insulate the home and keep it warmer. So I think it's interesting to think about how the designs um, that we have are specific for our place, but if you go to another place or another environment, they're going to need to design their home differently to survive the elements of nature that they confront. Okay, um, so now we've got our cardboard house and we talked about the wind, but we know that in storms, we're also dealing with a lot of rain, a lot of flooding. Um, so how can we adapt this cardboard house that we have to survive rain and floods? Okay, this is Grace from the chat box. You all were really good at coming up with solutions to high wind. What will we do to our cardboard box, our cardboard house to help it survive lots of rain and flooding? So what modifications put your engineering caps back on? How should we modify this house so that it can withstand lots of rain? And Michelle, um, Michelle's got it. She, one idea. Michelle says, raise it up. And uh, Katja says stilts. Alice and Paul say elevate it. I think everybody wants you to um, to raise it up. Good idea. <laughs> Those are really good ideas. Um, but first, I just want to make sure that we can demonstrate that my house is actually going to um, get wet or flood if rain hits it. Because otherwise, I mean, it might be fine like this. Cardboard is pretty sturdy stuff. Um, brought my crackers to me okay. So uh, in our activity, the way that we suggest you try this is putting the house in some kind of a bucket so that we're not going to have water flowing around everywhere. Uh, and I also put some grass in here just so you can watch the water level and I hope you can see that from home. And then I'm going to put a sponge inside the house and we're going to use that to collect the water if water gets inside my home but this will help us to determine if water gets inside so uh, i'll show you here i'm just going to put the sponge inside and then i'm going to put the roof back on we'll glue it back down that's another nice thing about using the play-doh but i did forget to mention that if you're going to build your house at home you guys said maybe tape um binder clips work well uh paper clips so you can build a cardboard house of your own and then do some designing with it with just the materials that you have around right now i have a colander that i'm going to use to make it rain are you guys ready for it to rain oh they're ready and we had a, a few more ideas so while it's raining can i share with you some of the other oh, ideas yeah. that came in yeah, so um, Alice and Paul suggested maybe building a wall in front of your um, house. And then Jackie and Mylene both suggested gutters and drains or longer eaves. And then um, Kai suggested maybe making the roof out of steel. And Julia said maybe you want to double the roof. So I think they're thinking about the roof. I have to be honest, I'm really worried about that sponge right now and what's happening at the base of the house. Um, <laughs> Because I see the water running off the roof, but I'm worried about the people living on the first floor of our house. <laughs> I, I think that's an important consideration. If you look around at your neighbor's homes, their roofs probably have some kind of covering on them to protect it, um, but not this cardboard house. So uh, I agree that we should do something to the roof and people normally do that, but my house comes all the way to the ground. It is not protected from bottom flooding. Uh, so I'm going to take the roof off and see what happened inside my house. Oh my gosh, it's so wet that the sponge couldn't even get all of it. I did not expect it to be this wet. So there's water pouring out and then I'll just measure this for you. So I'm squeezing out the sponge, which was completely dry when I put it inside. So we've demonstrated that this cardboard house will take on water if we let it rain. And now we're gonna go ahead and try some of the suggestions that you had for adapting it. I'm just gonna get rid of that rainwater. And then, um, so I heard that we need to elevate and that was like a big call from the very beginning. So let's go ahead and elevate the house. 
Oops. Before I put the root back on, I'm just going to put my dry sponge back inside so we can test after we've modified the home to see how our modifications uh, did. So I'm just going to use the Play-Doh to elevate the house because I have it handy right here. But of course, you could use other things if you wanted to do this yourself, um, something that wouldn't break down in the water. So my Play-Doh is only going to last a little while. But I want to make sure that I elevate the house high enough that I cover this water line so I can see where the water was. So let's put my bucket back up here. And I'll make some stilts. I think that's what you guys call them. We have a lot of homes here in Hawaii that are built um, on the shore that are on stilts, but I've also seen homes in, by rivers, on lakes, um, even over uh, some calm places in the ocean. Uh, they build homes on stilts. There's some really fancy hotels where you can stay and overlook the water. Okay. Literally oversleep the water as well if you're on stilts, right? <laughs> They're pretty cool. Um, okay, so we've got it up on stilts. Now, there was something else you guys were concerned with besides flooding from the bottom you were worried about? They were worried about the roof. So Julia suggested doubling it and Kai suggested making it out of a different material. So Kai suggested steel. Uh, and if there are any other ideas, feel free to write them in because I'll share them with Kanisa. If you have other, other modifications you think, um, and, and we did have the idea of gutters, gutters and pipes. Oh, yeah. Gutters are great. Um, we actually don't have gutters on our house right now, and it's really a problem when it rains because we took them off to get painted and we haven't put them back on, and I certainly feel the difference. So I'm going to use a different material, but for our activity here, I have these tea leaves, and they're really water resistant, and in fact, um, Many people build temporary homes or um, homes that are going to last for a short amount of time and they use uh, plants to help protect and keep the water out. And if you think about it, if you're outside and it's raining, you can go stand under a tree and it will keep you pretty dry. So for this activity, um, the leaves are going to work really well, but maybe for the long term, some other material. And um, like I said, we have our, our house has a roof with shingles and things that protect it. Metal roofs are really protecting and they also protect against fire. So depending if fire is an issue where you live, um, metal roofs can be really valuable. So um, Kenisa, we, had a, we have a question about the roof. And so sure. Anna and Leon are, are wondering, could you put grass on the roof like that picture you showed? Would that help to absorb the water? And that's a funny thing. I don't know too much about that particular grass roof. I think that some water would get absorbed, but I'm assuming, I, I would think that there's got to be something below the dirt and things that the grass is living on that prevents the water from going into the house. But that's a great question, and that's something you guys could research and um, report back to me and Grace. <laughs> I, I just... Think that that was fascinating and since i'd seen those pictures earlier this year i've now seen many many pictures from around the world of living roofs and even in in big cities um like rooftop gardens have been popular for hundreds of years and they're coming back into popularity as people want to grow their own food or um try to help stop uh to absorb some of the sunlight and make good use of it uh, so, but in that case, there's a real roof underneath and then they've made the garden on top. And I think it's probably the same for those living um, grass roofs. Okay, are we ready to test our modifications? We're ready. We're ready. I like the modifications. We've got our stilts. We've got our leaves on the roof. Let's see what happens. And the sponge is inside to tell us. Yep, the sponge is inside. I have the same amount of water and I've got my colander, which will give me a nice sort of simulated rain pattern. It's just a rainy day, it's raining away. I can see already though that my roof, the plants on my roof are shuttling that water straight off. And uh, the water that's flooding on my ground here is not reaching the bottom of my house. 
So I suspect that when I open that roof up, I'm going to find a pretty dry sponge. What do you guys think? Do you think the sponge is going to be drier than it was before? Go ahead and put it in the box. What do you think? Do you think our house? So Jackie thinks that it will still be a little bit damp inside, but not as wet as it was before. I think Jackie's probably right, but it's hard to say because it was damp. But my goodness, one drop of water came out of my sponge. And it's, if you can see inside, it's pretty darn dry in there. We did, we did some good work. Allison Paul predicted that. The kids from Bend, Oregon, Bodie, Katja, James, Isabella, Mylene, Allison Paul, you all predicted it correctly. Good modifications too to the house that you've built there. Most excellent. So I have some other um, pictures to show you. I'm going to turn my screen back on. Um, you guys talked about elevation and as we showed in this um, experiment here, the elevation did do a nice job of protecting our home uh, from, sorry, okay. Um, did a nice job of protecting our home. The, our sponge did not get wet. And I wanted to share with you that people have been elevating their homes in flood areas or coastal areas for thousands of years. This is an image that I got from Wikipedia of the indigenous peoples of the Kamchatka Peninsula, which is near to Alaska. And these are, this is their summer homes, but they were elevated to help protect them against flooding. Um, and then all around the world in modern times, people do similar type of work. And of course, it's a lot of work to build, to elevate the house. It costs more. Um, you need more engineering design. You have to make sure that those stilts or pilings are very stable. Uh, but it is definitely a design, an engineering design solution that can help us to withstand um, storms. Okay. Um, in our cardboard house trials, though, when I had my colander out, we saw that the rain came straight down. And even my flood water it's still sitting there but it's it's not moving and when you guys describe the storms that you've been in you guys all describe things moving the wind moving um the hail moving and certainly flood water from regular storms can move really fast rivers move really fast when they get full and they can cause a lot of damage um or, and and they're dangerous for people who get stuck in them and tsunamis are kind of an extreme example of that. And so when engineers are trying to design um, homes or buildings to survive storms, they often want to look to the most extreme example. And then they know if they can make the home survive that, it will definitely be able to withstand our everyday storm. So I'm going to show you a short clip from our episode about um, building to withstand tsunamis. Hawaii is, is somewhat unique in that we face a lot of the hazards that uh, exist around the world, more than most other locations. So the Tohoku tsunami was obviously devastating for Japan, but it also caused quite a lot of damage here in Hawaii. Is it possible for us to design buildings to survive these tsunamis? The Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004 showed us there were a lot of videos taken of that event and showed us that a lot of people survived by getting into their hotel and going up in their hotel and just watching it happen. FEMA's idea anyway was why don't we build buildings and the Japanese were doing this already. Why don't we build buildings to survive the tsunami? They obviously need to be taller than the flow depth so that people can use the upper floors as a vertical evacuation. So I thought that this was a really neat comment and actually I learned from making this episode that if a building is designed to with is more than 16 stories and it's designed to withstand a uh, earthquake that it can actually lose its bottom two floors and often even one or two of its major pilings and still stay standing so this idea of vertical evacuation to be safe from flooding or hurricane or a tsunami uh, is being used in coastal areas and they're uh, identifying places in Waikiki that are already in Honolulu, Hawaii, that are already 
um, able to withstand a tsunami so that people could go up high. Uh, similarly, off the uh, west coast of Washington and Oregon, there are vertical evacuation buildings for communities that can't get to high mountains um, quick enough. And then um, if we talk about other communities that are just vulnerable because they're so close to the shore, uh, the question is, can they do similar things? Like, can they elevate or should they let the water in? And I took this picture on the west side of the island of Maui in Hawaii. Um, and these condominiums, as um, I'm not sure if you can tell, but right up along the shore, there's a bunch of sandbags to help protect the little bit of beach that they have left. But in some places, the beach is eroding and the edge of the building is going away. And the condo buildings are so big that they can't retreat. They can't just dig them up and move them farther inland. Um, so they're talking about doing different things, like maybe extending the beach again, digging up more sand and moving it to help protect the buildings. Or maybe they could even take out the bottom two floors and let the water come in and still live above the water and, and be safe for a while. Uh, and then I'm going to show you another clip. So we did an episode where we talked with architecture students at the University of Hawaii and they showed us their plans um, and ideas and imaginations for how could we create more resilient coastal communities. And their ideas are just really fabulous and they what's really neat too is that a lot of the work that they do is with um, cardboard and fake houses and things and they move them around to um, help communicate their ideas and even to help themselves understand what it might look like. You can see that a lot of these low-lying areas that we're inhabiting where the airport is located in Waikiki, the drivers of the state economy, some of these soft defense systems such as living shorelines could be implemented. For example, here at the mouth of the Alawai Canal, where currently we're using this space to dock boats. It's one of the most polluted water bodies in the country that drains into the ocean. Why don't we think of this as an opportunity to create a biodiverse, resilient marsh that could both clean the water runoff from the Alawai and at the same time be a buffer that defends what lies behind from the impact of you know, sea level rise and storm surge. And then they go on to talk about maybe even elevating the roadways and having people commute through downtown Honolulu by boats. And so they're just really neat ideas. And I wanted to share with you that there's so much opportunity for you guys to go on and, and have careers and to try to answer these questions as our, our coastal communities near the ocean, but also our, our communities near rivers and lakes that need to adapt to. Um, water that's coming all around us. But before, um, oh, I guess that would be a good place to take any questions, Grace. Sure, this is Grace from the chat box. And I will warn you, Kinesa, that we're almost out of time. So, and just as a reminder, because one of the questions that came in was, how can we get the um, directions for how to do that cardboard um, house at home? I just want to remind you that the NOAA Live uh, website where you went and registered for this. So if you just Google NOAA Live for Kids, you'll come to our Woods Hole Sea Grant page and all the directions are there under a Kinesis listing. But I also put it in the, um, the chat box in case you have a pencil and you can write it down right there. So any last questions that folks have? So let's see, one of the questions is, um, you showed us some examples of what they're doing in Hawaii. Are there some of the same um, types of housing modifications being done in other parts of the country. And I think this comes from Nicole um, here in Massachusetts. Oh, thank you, Nicole. Yes, absolutely. And in fact, um, in Hawaii, we have pretty high islands. So our coastal areas where most of our homes are built are very near shore and flat, but we do have places where we can go up higher a bit. Um, but other places in the country, and I'm thinking right now of Miami, Florida, where the land is is pretty flat for a very long time. And so even a little bit of wave run up or sea level rise will move very, very far inland. And um, researchers here in Hawaii are certainly talking with people in places like Miami to see what are they doing. And 
Um, a lot of the short-term fixes involve things like pumping water out. But if you look to other places in the world, um, for example, like uh, Venice, where they've, uh, in Italy, where they have lived for a long time with the water coming in, and they do do things like travel by boat. And so looking for um, innovative ideas and, and places around the world that have adapted um, to let the water in, because water, as we know, is, is so powerful, and especially moving water um, has so much force behind it that we can't always stop it. And so if we can allow it to come in in organized ways, then we can kind of adapt and, and make our communities more resilient. Thank you. And Michelle is asking, um, Michelle from Hawaii, what channel carries uh, your Voice of the Sea on TV? Oh, awesome. We're on K5, which used to be Channel 5, but now it's Channel 6. So um, uh, if you're on Spectrum Cable, it's on Channel 6, but you can also find all of our episodes online. Um, we're on YouTube and Vimeo, but if you just go to voiceofthesea.org, voiceofthesea.org, and the link's also on the NOAA Live um, a website page, you can get to all of our episodes that way and you can search them and we have links to um, other information or activities that go along with the episodes. Great, yeah, and the, 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 all the episodes that Kanisa showed are on the NOAA Live page, which will, will get you to the right place. And just to share, thank you so much, Eve, for sharing this, that the California Academy of Science has a living roof and has some information on their website. So I will try to add that link to the NOAA Live page as well, so you can live, learn a little bit more about living roofs since we had a question about that. Uh, one last question before we move on. Um, Bodhi's wondering, do you have any animals and do they get scared during the big storms or when it floods? Um, I only have a fish and he gets afraid when we move his tank and stuff. So he probably is afraid, but he he's a beta fish and he hides a lot anyway. My mom has a dog and she just lives a couple blocks away from me and the dog definitely gets afraid. And so I think as a pet owner, that's one of the things that um, my mom has to do is to make sure she's home when it's stormy or that she has the dog with her because he, he would be really afraid otherwise. Um, and a lot of times if you pay attention to animals, um, they can, they're aware that the weather's changing, um, maybe the humidity, the amount of water in the air is changing. So they may know a storm's coming um, before we even recognize it. Great. Well, I'm going to, we have just a couple more minutes. So I'm going to let you finish up, Kanisa. I know you um, have one or two more things to show us. You know, Grace, the only thing I, I wanted to you do can... was that um, we talked about preparing your home, but I think that it's really important that we don't leave without also saying that to be storm ready, you also need to be ready and your pets need to be ready and your family needs to be ready. So to um, build, make a plan and, and build a kit. Um, and I have a little video I can share, but Grace also suggested that you guys might just be able to tell me um, about your plan and the types of supplies that you and your family have to be storm ready. And while we're answering those, I'm just going to put up um, my last slide, which um, shows that um, storm from my window, that 2018 storm that uh, made so much rain for us and this is actually the middle of the night but you can see that it looks super bright out my window because there was so much lightning that um it, the sky was bright it was a, a crazy storm um but that's my email there kanisa at hawaii.edu and uh i'd like you to tell me maybe about your plan for staying safe and the supplies you're going to gather to keep you and your family and your pets um, to have a good time and be able to enjoy the storm and not be um, um, unsafe. All right, so that's a good question, everyone. This is Grace from the chat box again. And so Kinesis question, what would you put in your um, sort of safety kit so that you'd be prepared for a storm? And Anthony says um, water, that's good, batteries, extra food. Anything else that you think if you had to maybe withstand a storm that could be short or maybe multiple days, what would you need in your, your kit? And, and what sort of plan would you need? I shared with Kanisa that, um, and I'll come back on since we're at the end here. I shared with Kanisa that I have two sons 
And um, part of being in the Cub Scouts is they had to come up with a plan if something were to happen and we were to get separated. So let's see, um, Bodhi suggests that maybe you might wanna have uh, a bunker, which I think is a, is a unique idea or, or place a safe place and a flashlight. Um, Isabella says food, water, and flashlights. Michelle says you might want a first aid kit. Um, Jackie says snacks, same thing, water, flashlight with batteries. That's a good, good catch there. You wanna have extra batteries or at least have batteries to make it run. First aid kit and sleeping bags. Alice and Paul say maybe um, shoes, a radio and gloves. We have one of those special radios that you um, power by turning a crank so that you can listen to the weather service and know what's happening. And um, Eve, this is what I was getting at with the plan with my kids, a meetup place if you have to leave the house. So have a designated spot. Ours is out front by a certain tree um, where we're gonna meet. And um, Anna says uh, maybe her dad would definitely need his cell phone charger. That's a good <laughs> idea. Alice and Paul say maybe harnesses for the dogs propane for your stove to make coffee uh, and layers in case it's cold and maybe a generator. So I told you this was a pretty savvy crew, right? They're pretty knowledgeable. You guys are brilliant. I really enjoyed all of your feedback today. I think I'll just add a couple of things that um, when we talked to the emergency management folks in downtown Honolulu that they brought up that I thought were interesting. And, and one was to have a contact that's far away. Um, that you could call and notify to let them know that you're okay. So just in case all of your family wasn't able to meet up in the same spot, that someone would be, you'd be able to call a friend or a family member who was outside of your storm area and, and find out that your friends and family are okay. Um, another thing that he mentioned was to make sure you have all the medicine and food that you need. So um, not just for yourself, but for your pets and, um, for maybe there's elderly people in your family. Um, and then he also mentioned to make sure you pack games and things to do for your kids, uh, which I thought, sure, if you're stuck in a storm for a couple of days um, without your stuff, you might be pretty bored and you're, you might not have electricity to charge that cell phone. So some books or cards or something that are small but can help to keep you entertained is a fun but important thing to, to put in your kit, I think. Excellent. I want to just thank you. Um, we're about out of time, so I'm going to hold on to any other questions that come in. But one thing I wanted to share, because we did just in the last day or two have a pretty big storm here on the Cape, and I was wondering if I could share with you what one of the pictures that our Sea Grant specialist um, took of, of some of the uh, effects of the flooding and the winds that we just had. So if you don't mind, yeah. I'm going to share my screen really quick and just show you that picture of a picture of um, a local picture, I guess is how I would say it. So let's see. I'm going to show my screen. All right. Can you see that? So that house um, had some flooding damage. And that's oh, one of those um, on the outer cape. And then we also had um, this house. Oh my. See, had, yeah, um, had some major um, damage. And then just the last picture, you can see that they had some damage down below. So just to give you a little local flavor, these are within the last day or two, that it's really important that you are prepared and ready for these big storms if you live in an area where you might um, be exposed to them. All right, thank you so much. Really appreciate it, Kanisa. Just uh, wonderful to um, build that house with you. Thank you again to Trisha and Crystal for our American Sign Language interpretation. Thank you to all our viewers. It's so exciting to have you here. And I just want to invite you next week, same place, same time. We're going to be talking about ocean acidification. So if you're an animal that builds a shell, we're going to talk about why you need to know all about ocean acidification, because it's going to be really important to your health. All right. I'll see you all next week and thanks again. We hope. Bye bye.